Next up, we have George from Google. So I'm here to talk about uh, Google's globally distributed monitoring service, Monarch, some of the scaling challenges we've had, the solutions, the things we've bumped our, to bumped our toes on. I'll give you a little bit of background. So monitor monitoring at Google is a global problem. We have data centers and points of presence all over the globe. And besides that global span, we have huge volume. We have tens of billions of monitor targets which turns into about nine trillion streams, and we ingest about two and a half terabytes a second of metric data into our system. We have a very strong culture of monitoring at Google. You don't run things in production if you don't know how they work and you aren't measuring them, and every team's responsible for setting this up. So what that means for us is that monitoring is constantly changing at Google as the software, run, as the software that Google runs evolves, and Monarch has to change with it. So I'll talk about, towards the last half of this talk, the essentials for scaling our system, which are basically, for me, three themes. Maintaining good hygiene for your backends, like concurrency and that sort of thing. Scaling horizontally, which is really the only practical way we can scale this system. And reducing dimensionality early for our really largest users. And we'll talk more about that later. So let's talk, as some background, let's talk about the architecture and data model and that sort of thing. So we have data centers all over the globe. We'll need to monitor things all over the globe. Where do we start? Well, we start locally. We break the world into zones, and a zone for us is a strongly connected network region. Think of like a building with compute clusters in it, or maybe even a group of buildings where that com all that is uh, strongly connected in the network sense, right? Um, we monitor and store locally within the zone, so data is stored near where it's collected. And we're managing this as a global system, you know, doing queries globally and alerting globally, but these zones, uh, and these zones are part of that larger system, but they can oper operate autonomously if, like, there's a WAN cut, you can still get an alert in a particular zone. And we run this as a monitoring service for the rest of Google. Uh, so users don't set this up themselves. We run this for them. So let's look inside one of these zones. Uh, what, is a zo what goes on inside a zone? Ingestion, retention, and queries. So ingestion, ingestion starts with a target. That's the piece of, piece of software that's running in a zone. Some application, a VM, specialized collector, a piece of hardware, what have you. So they're all instrumented. They're all instrumented with a library we call StreamZ and it has classes that define metrics, the unit of information that we monitor. And this has the ability to, this library has the ability to contact our monitoring system, send it data about the targets, send it the metric values, right? So what are metrics? And I know this, is, this audience probably knows this in more depth, but I'll give an overview for those that don't. Um, metrics are a measurement of some aspect of that monitored target. So for us, we'll name a metric w with a uh, static descriptor. It's the name, it's the data type, classification field. So this is, a, this is an example. HTTP server response latency is pretty basic, right? You know, you have your path, you have your status code, and then we have a distribution of, of, uh, for a distribution of latency, right? So we can do things like percentiles and we can combine these so that you can get percentiles over a set of servers, right? We can, mo we can monitor counters, ints, bools, floats, and strings, right? And they're classified by these, by these labels so that you can see, so that you can later on do aggregations of them. So let's talk a little bit about targets. Targets are named by labels that identify them. There's a mechanism that fits, they have na name value pairs. They emit name value pairs. We have a way to fit those labels into fixed schema, which are ways of identifying the targets in our system. So this is an example of a job running under our Borg job management system, which identifies, identifies tasks by user, job, cell, which is the physical location, and a task number so you could, you know, when you're running thousands of instances of your job. And this is a very common target schema. So these series of, of values uh, 
in this target schema gives us an ordered space of names for targets. So the, when that data is sent to us, it goes to an ingestion router. The ingestion router identifies those targets, figures out where the data should land. In the case of large users, we can do some pre-aggregation at this step. And then where's the data go? The data goes to the leaf. The leaf is central to our monitoring. It's our in-memory database. It's the lowest level in our recording hierarchy. Targets are portioned to these leaves by lexicographical range, right? So you get ranges of similarly named targets, which makes sense when you're aggregating over things, right? Um, the ingestion routers track which leaves have which ranges, so that's how the data makes it to them. Leaves receive the data, they record it in their in-memory database, they write it to recovery logs, which are for if a leaf crashes or you have to move data for load balancing, it's by reading the recovery log files. And then uh, that also provides a path to a repository. Uh, the, so the, the targets send individual metric values, the leaf retains streams of these metric values, which look like this. So a stream has an identifier, which is the label values from the target, from the metric, the metric name, and then a history of time-stamped values. Uh, and, the time, and those timestamp values are the ones that were sent by the target. And that yields a data model for queries. So in our system, this looks like table, looks like relational tables, right? The name of the tables, the target scheme, and the metric name. And then you have columns that define um, the structure, right? So that you can do selection, you can do joins, and et cetera. And then you have a column that has the actual time series. So this is l physically distributed across our zones and our leaves, but from the point of view of queries, it's queried as a table. So data is retained in these recovery logs, and we have an assigner that's constantly doing load balancing all the time, because when you're scaling horizontally, meaning bring up more nodes, really you want the memory usage and CPU usage per backend to be roughly constant, right? Um, so to move things around, it uses those recovery logs, as I talked before, and it provides a path to the repository. Um, so queries, the zone, final thing that the zone can do is queries. So a query comes into a job called a zone mixer, and the zone mixer examines the query and decides, okay, what leaves have the data? And then it sends the, the, the <coughs> it sends the, the query to the leaves. The leaves combine data from their in-memory store and from their on-disk repository. They'll do some of the aggregation, send their, send their intermediate results back, and the zone mixer will aggregate those intermediate results. And that's how we distribute a computation over many, many CPUs when we have a complex query. So finally, in the zone, if you want to get an alert, we have an evaluator that's constantly issuing these queries, writing the data back into the leaves, and then looking at the alert threshold and saying, oh, is it time to wake you up at 2 in the morning? Yes, it is. <laughs> so that's a zone, a self-contained monitoring system for a strongly connected network region. But we are a global service. How does that work? So the zones are integrated into a single system by global monarch. This is logically centralized. It's the place the user interacts with Monarch as a global system, but it's itself physically distributed. This provides a global view of what's going on in the zones and has machinery so that a user can configure how the whole of Monarch is going to act for that user. So first I'll talk, touch on configuration. Uh, configuration lives in our config server, which sits over top of Spanner, which is the same Spanner that if you if you use uh, our Google Cloud product, it's that same thing. And then that's sort of replica that's replicated to the zones, so the zones can operate independently. And the things that are stored in this configuration, the user can figure it, can configure what they're collecting, how long they want to retain it for, uh, downsampling, that sort of thing. They can, they can, uh, you can, it stores our metrics, our target schemas, queries for the evaluator, console definitions, that sort of thing. <coughs> 
For queries, we have root mixers that have the same relation to the zones that those zone mixers had to the leaves. So this is, where, this is actually where queries come in from users, and again, it's the same process. This uh, zone mixer will fan out the query to the zones that, ha that it thinks have the data. And we can also do evaluation at the global level, too, if you need a, like a global QPS number. So scaling horizontally is the key point. We have a unified global system. We collect, retain, we query. It's distributed and robust. And as we get bigger, we bring up new zones, which means we have more zones and more leaves. Uh, let's briefly look at a query so you get a flavor of what that looks like. So we have a Python. We have more than one query notation. This is the Python-based query notation. And this is just a basic example, right? The fetch is sort of like a select which selects what's, what time series we're going to operate on from, from that uh, table I showed you before. The window step aligns things in time to allow aggregation because different targets might have sent points at different times, and you have to line them up in time so you can add them together. And then uh, group by does the aggregation. You can compute percentiles. You can do a whole lot more than this. This is just like a tiny example to give you the flavor of it. So when we get queries, they come into that root mixer, right? And at each step, we proceed from global to local, local and back to global. And each step, these mixers decide what part of the query that they're going to execute and what part they're going to delegate down. And this is determined by the physical location in the data and on the query. I don't know if you remember, there was a cell column. That's the data center column. It's the physical location. So we can decide which parts of the query can be uh, done where. And we can see that here. So the initial query came into the root mixer, got sent to the zone mixer. The zone mixer looked at the query and says, well, I have to do the group, the final aggregation in that percentile, but let me forward some of that onto the leaf. The leaf will do the fetch from both the historical repository in memory, do the window operation, do some of the aggregation, and then this is propagated back up, and you get the final result back. So we have a global monitoring system. I'll give you a little bit of flavor how you use it. This is one of our internal front ends. We actually have a couple of internal front ends. Um, this is for Google engineers to configure Monarch and serve graphs and consoles uh, per user configuration, that sort of thing. Uh, they configure what they want to collect, how they, long they want to retain it for, and how frequently. And we have a GUI that walks you through building queries. In some ways, I prefer the GUI to the language, actually, because you get to see all options at once. And we can configure alerts so we can be woken up. And you can set up consoles that are sets of graphs and that sort of thing. I mean, this is things that people are familiar with, I'm sure. Um, so this is the part. This is the fun part of the talk for me, because these are the things that I've learned in scaling this system. So we want to maintain good hygiene, which is concurrency on backends, that sort of thing. We want to scale horizontally, and it's really our only practice, practical solution. But this is surprisingly challenging. And for us large users with enormous cardinality, some an early dimensional reduction will be necessary, and we'll talk about that. So. Concur so good hygiene, what does that mean? So first of all, in a system like ours that's so highly distributed and highly concurrent, we don't want to make our long tails longer. And I'll give you a little bit of a flavor of something that happened a year or two ago, a couple years ago. So we're distributing our queries to our backends, and on average, these backends are getting about 200 queries per second. And then a month later, they're getting 1,000 queries per second. And then a month later, it's 2,000 queries per second. And then it's 5,000 queries per second. And we're on fire a little bit because we're starting to blow out our latency for both queries and for inserting data into Monarch. So that turned out to be that we had one lock over two important indices and two important data structures inside that leaf process. And you know, some of those leaves would operate fine, but some of those leaves in the long tail of the 125,000 leaves that we have monitoring Google would blow out. So 
lesson here is don't have one lock protecting a large amount of data. You know, uh, fine green locking's your friend, atomic stuff is kind of your friend, although it's hard to debug, RCU is your friend, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's an important lesson. Um, so the second lesson learned with good hygiene is don't let components languish too long without assessing whether, they're good, whether they'll scale or have critical and unaddressed problems, because it'll come and bite you. And it's always the component that you think is working great, right? So we had that assigner component that's doing all that load balancing. And last summer, we had this outage, which sometimes happens in a system where you're doing global queries. Somebody sets up a configuration of death, and bang, all those leaves crash at once. Wow, that was exciting. So. We bring the system back up, and most of the zones come back up, but the largest zones, because things tend to grow and people tend to build more capacity in the data centers, in the, some of those larger zones, it took 12 hours for that assigner to bring that zone back with an SLO. And that was with SREs going, oh, let me figure this out. Let me try to figure that out, you know? That was, we heard a lot about that, <laughs> all right? So it made us reassess that component and redesign it, and we took, you know, there were concurrency lessons that we had to learn in there, too. And uh, our team, and Josh and Arnold are in the audience here, too, we worked really hard at redesigning this component and rebuilding it. So when that outage happened in June of this year, the one that was in the news, the network one, well, it was a very similar scenario from Monarch's point of view, but when that network came back, we were within SLO in 20 minutes, and nobody had to touch anything, you know? And that's a lesson. If you can keep on top of these components, you're going to have a more reliable, si a more reliable system. But that's hard, because there's a lot of components for a big system like this. And third, on good hygiene, always be deprecating, right? Old, old APIs will get in the way of scaling. So we moved from a pull to a push model. So like a pull model is, you know, those leaves connect to the target and then the data is streamed back to Monarch, you know, like a along a persistent connection. And we moved from that to a push model because this is stateful. It costs memory to keep these connections. And you have to keep track of these targets, right? So we moved from pull to push. And that saved a dozen engineers worth of RAM in getting rid of that state, which was a insane number, right? But it took a couple of years but it, because it touched every binary at Google. It was worth it because we got rid of an outage-prone component as well. Okay, so uh, the big lesson learned for us is scaling horizontally. It's hard, but it's the only way to make the system like this bigger. And that for us, that's increasing the number of leaves in zones. So we have a few things we have to watch out for. You know, we have cent centralized services that can become bottlenecks. You know, that assigner t really taught us that that assigner was a centralized component that could take out a whole zone. So if you have some critical scaling dimension you could sh that you can shard along, you should shard components like that. So we want to get to a point where we can run multiple assigners in a zone. And when you, th this is a big one, and it's going to sound obvious, but <coughs> it wasn't necessarily obvious to me. When you increase the number of leaves in your end zones, you're making the implicit assumption that each individual backend is going to be effectively constant size. Because you're doing load balancing, you're trying to assure that, right? And that its internal data structures are going to be the same size as well. Well, that latter part is tricky. For example, the configuration of what the user is going to retain has to be pruned per leaf or you're going to end up sending this, the whole configuration for the whole world to every backend, which at one point we did. And eventually, more configuration data was stored in each backend than actual data. And that's real, what that is, is that's an n squared mistake. So you'll find those over and over again and correct those over and over again. Um, and then similarly for queries, you want query cost to be about even on a per backend basis. That means you have to control query fan out. And for our system, we do this with a Bloom filterish indexing service that runs in parallel with those mixers that keeps a notion of what data might be on each of the leaves. So when a query goes along, the mixer doesn't talk to everything in the zone. It talks to what it thinks has the data. And concurrency hygiene has been important in building this service as well. <coughs> 
So finally for us, because we're really large, we have to deal with some early dimensional reduction. Big users can send us more data than they can afford to store in our system. And that, that, that's the reason for aggregation. So a use case is disk usage at Google. Think about how many bytes each user is using on each disk at Google, right? That's a phenomenally large number of streams. If you multiply the number of disks, which is in the zillions, and the number of users, which are, you know, internal users, which are many tens of thousands, that's an unreasonable number of streams to store in our system. So if we cut the dimensions by user, by disk type, et cetera, only what someone needs to see, we can answer questions like, how much disk space do the user use in Iowa? And we do this by doing aggregation as we ingest the data. Those ingestion routers do some aggregation. Uh, and then the final aggregation happens on the leaves. And it's interesting because get, making that efficient is not making the aggregation efficient, but it's making processing the user configuration, matching it with the data, and getting the data right to place efficient. And that's actually more expensive than the aggregation. Now, that number I said, two and a half terabytes per second, about 1.8 terabytes per second of that data is being processed by this, this uh, early aggregation. But if you're doing that, that means you're throwing away the user's data and keeping an aggregation. And, but for debugging, you have to be able to provide context. And you're sort of like Ben said, you have to be able to see through that aggregation. So we have ways of doing that too. So here's a heat map of a bunch of servers, right? And we can see that, you know, the latency is starting to blow out in this group of servers. Uh-oh, so what do we do? So for us, we have the ability to retain traces through that aggregation and to retain labels that we're dropping in the aggregation, sample values, and do sampling so that we can give you a look back through the aggregation and provide context. So let's click on that latency blowout. Oh, well, there you go. See all these little dots, and there's a little T in there, too. There's a couple Ts. The Ts are trace, dapper traces. The little vertical bars are where we did sampling during the aggregation. And we see when we clicked on one spot, we highlighted a whole bunch of other spots. And those spots are all the same back end, right? It was one back end that was having a problem, right? So we can provide context here by giving you, if, if nothing else, we can tell you which back end because we can remember the labels. We can give you a trace providing context for the traces. Remember, Ben says, Traces provide context. We can provide context for traces, so it go, it's synergistic, right? And we can also provide a coordinate into the logs because you have the labels you dropped and you have the precise time instant of this sample. We can tell you where in the logs that was, so we know all these things at the same time. It's a very powerful debugging technique. So that's what actually makes this early dimensional reduction practical because otherwise, you know, the user loses the, that, that ability to debug through it, and it's not a, they won't use it. So that's, in summary, these are my lessons. Maintain good hygiene, scale horizontally, it's hard. Reduce dimensions early for your big users. And this is kind of a sampling. This is my sampling. This is my experience of the project. There are a lot more lessons learned. I'm sure other members of our team would give it to a talk. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening. Oh, yeah, thanks. Woo! Oh, yeah, I'll thank hold you, on. George. Uh, we have time for a few questions for George. Who'd like to start? Uh, right back there. Hey, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question about your global query experience. So you yeah. mentioned that you store uh, all the data in like each single zone. Yeah. Um, but without, and you mentioned that if there's like a cutoff, you can still access that single zone. But how yeah. do you deal with the user experience of without replicating of say, uh, if one zone gets cut off and the user was looking at a graph for a single region and then suddenly like all the bars in their graph have dropped by, you know, a third or in some that, cases. Can you, you know, honestly, it? that happens. You know, but the, the thing is, is that comes back too. When that zone goes away, it doesn't mean that, you know, unless 
you know, unless the asteroid strikes that we're, we stop monitoring there. We're still monitoring there. You just might see it. So you might hit refresh on your graph and bang, it comes back. Does that make sense? Uh, right here in the front. I have a microphone for you. Here it comes. Hi, right, thanks. Great talk. Um, I'm curious about uh, if you guys encounter situations where you have vast swaths of data that's unused, it's never read. <laughs> never deal with that. Is that something you, you think? address? And then second, um, yeah, uh, uh, do you guys have uh, a way of handling like semantic conventions or enforcing like structure on the metrics that you collect so that you can do like cross-target aggregations for projections and things like that? Okay, let me let me answer the the first. The first one, wait, say the first one again. The unused data. Oh, yeah, unused data. Well, the thing is, you saw there was retention configuration, right? There's retention configuration and users by quota, right? So those two things alone are usually enough to prune data that users don't care about at the large scale. On the second sense, we can do, in the second one, we can do queries, we can remap IDs during queries and that sort of thing to do cross schema joins and, and bring things together. Well, two, two ways. One is that m we have a horizontal monitoring team who actually does collection for common things like RPC metrics across the whole fleet. So most people don't actually have to set up most of the common metrics. We set them up for them. And then you know, we, ha we, we have good documentation. We try to teach people. We have office hours. But there is a certain amount of variance. Sure. Thanks, George. Thank um, you. Uh, no, uh, no, wait. Don't walk away, George. Oh, oh, I thought it was another was question. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Another question. My bad. Uh, other questions for George? Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Very biased. Ha. Hey, uh, at some point in your talk, you said from changing from a pull to a push model, you quant you saved a dozen engineers worth of RAM. Yeah. What does that mean? That means George isn't going to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know that I can answer that in quantifiable terms beyond, you know, RAM costs money. You know, we had to buy it, you have to depreciate it, you have to pay electricity for it, right? So there's a cost for that RAM, right? So we, the amount of, we have a ways of sort of roughly quantifying that as engineers so you can decide in Google, is it worthwhile doing this optimization? And if somebody's going to do that optimization, how much did you save the company? And we saved the company a lot of money by doing that. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, you mean the yeah. Uh, other questions? One more question for George. Ah, there's one. Awesome. Not in the middle. Ah, it's Michael. Can someone get Michael a mic? Uh, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, you talked about using percentiles as far as roll-ups, and I was wondering if you were using approximate histograms, and if so, how you made sure they were sufficiently accurate, or if you had full fidelity histograms? We, um, I'm not sure what you mean with uh, full fidelity versus approximate. I mean, we have bucketed histograms, basically, with, but we keep tr count of the precise population and standard deviation and that sort of thing, and we have ways of resizing them when they when these differ is that part of the configuration the, the bucketing yes thank you thank you very much george thank you very much cheers